Great. All right, welcome back from lunch. Let's talk about Python and about games. <laughs> uh, I am the CTO at Battlehouse. My background is in 3D animation and more recently online gaming. Uh, I've been a Python fan for over 16 years, uh, so I'm delighted to participate here in the community. Um, I, my wife is in school in Geneva, and so I decided to drop by to this really cool conference. Um, the other day I was looking through my home directory and found the oldest Python file that I'd written, which dates back to the year 2000. Uh, and one other thing you might notice is my code is in a directory called CVS, because back when I started, Git had not been invented for many years, and SVN was still this kind of scary, unstable new thing. So we all used CVS. Now, Battlehouse. Uh, we are a, a five-year-old company with a small team. We're distributed. We work online from all over the world. And uh, what we do is we basically make big games with Python. We have uh, one game engine that drives uh, seven different game titles uh, in different genres. And they're available uh, to play on four different platforms. I will give you a quick example of one of our games through our promo video here. Yeah. So that uh, is our top game called Thunder Run. Um, we've had over 4 million people log in and play. Uh, on any given day, there's um, typ typically about uh, 20,000 uh, active users. And at any one given time, we usually have about 1,000 concurrent players on the servers. Uh, so our games are what we call builder real-time strategy, builder RTS games. Um, there's a real-time combat component where you have units driving around and shooting at each other, um, combined with a sort of base management system where you um, build facilities and upgrade them, do research, and unlock more powers for your army. Um, these are published on a couple of different platforms. We started out on uh, Facebook uh, as a sort of desktop browser app uh, in the Facebook frame, and we just built our own um, our own uh, sort of social platform where you can play the games without needing a Facebook login called Battlehouse.com. Uh, so in this talk, um, I'm going to give a very quick overview of the architecture of our game systems, and then I'm going to focus much more specifically on writing um, an asynchronous network server in Python. And I also have some tips for sort of bridging the gap between the tutorial level stuff and an actual production service. Um, I'd just like to get an idea uh, of um, your experience here. If, if you've written any kind of network server, could you please raise your hand? Good, cool. And if you've written an asynchronous network server, cool. Um, it took us a long time to figure out how to do this, and I think the, um, the resources out there um, are still um, sort of inadequate for teaching people how to write asynchronous servers. So I'm hoping to contribute um, a little bit to that. Okay, so let's talk about how the game systems are put together here. We think of a game as a combination of really three things. There's the engine, which is the code, um, that actually executes on, on the servers and on the client. 
We have what we call game data, uh, which is kind of like the levels and the units and the stats and abilities of everything. And then there's uh, an art package, which contains all of the images and sounds. Um, so going, breaking this down a little more, on the engine side, we've got um, a big piece of server software that runs um, in the cloud. We've got client software that runs on your browser. And then we have um, a third component, which is sort of internal analytics tools um, that players don't see, but that give uh, we, the team, insight into how the games are doing. Um, as I said, the game, the game data is sort of like the stats of all the units and buildings and items in the game, uh, and the art is the images and sounds. So among the different game titles we have, the engine always stays the same, and we produce a new game by coming up with um, a new sort of module of game data and artwork. Uh, this has been really successful for us because um, all of the updates and improvements that go into the game engine apply to all of our game titles. Um, so, you know, we've had, we have a, a five-year-old game and we have a game that just came out this year, and they're both taking advantage of the latest updates we've made to, you know, the network code and the, and the database code and so on. Um, so, you can think of our game engine kind of like a very complicated web app that's got a front end that runs on the browser and a back end that runs on the server. The um, server side of it, of course, is written in Python. And um, we have very few dependencies, but the main one is this wonderful networking library called Twisted, which I'm going to spend some time talking about because it's sort of the, the core engine of our server. Um, on the client side, um, the actual part of the game that players interact with is written in JavaScript. Uh, we use the Google Closure compiler to do optimization and obfuscation of that. And we're using um, HTML5 technologies um, to, to do the graphics and sound. Um, there's some other pieces here. There, there's, as I mentioned, an analytics system, which involves some pretty uh, heavy data manipulation. Um, there's also a complex build pipeline to create the data uh, that's loaded into each game title. That's also, that also uses a whole lot of Python, but I don't have time to talk about it today. Um, and then there's a whole art build pipeline that takes 3D models of tanks and airplanes and renders them out and turns them into sprites for the game, which is also really cool, but I don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> All right, so let's focus much more specifically now on the server. Um, the server works, like I said, kind of like a, a sophisticated web app. Um, the browser, as you're playing the game, is sending requests to the server over the network. And these requests are things like, I want to upgrade this unit, I want to manufacture a tank, or I want to buy something in the store. And then what the server does is it first has to check the requirements to make sure that you actually can do the action that you're trying to do um, so that players can't cheat by, you know, sort of telling the server, you know, I have a million dollars or whatever. Um, so it performs some checks, and then it mutates some state in a database um, somewhere that, that updates the player, and then it sends a reply uh, to the client. So it's, it's kind of the same way that, that a traditional database uh, sort of CRUD app would work. Um, so we have some pretty stiff design requirements um, for these servers. Uh, as I mentioned, we're pretty high scale in terms of the number of, of players who play each day and, and the number of simultaneous connections. Um, the toughest requirement, though, is latency. Uh, because this is an interactive game, um, latency is sort of life and death for us. And if the game server takes too long to respond to a command that the player gives it, um, <laughs> you get very frustrated players. It's a very frustrating experience when you try to, you know, click to launch an attack and the server just sits there spinning and then the other guy comes in and, and destroys your stuff because he had a faster network connection. Um, so we try very, very hard um, to keep the latency down. Uh, so. Uh, in order to do that, we use um, Twisted, and it's written in the form of an asynchronous uh, HTTP server, and I'll talk uh, in much more detail about how that works. Um, it executes as a cluster of processes on the Amazon cloud. Um, 
and it basically scales out horizontally by running more concurrent instances of this process. And um, so far, we haven't seen a limit to that yet. We just basically add another core for, for every 100 simultaneous players. OK, so Twisted. Uh, Twisted is a very comprehensive networking library for Python. It's built around an asynchronous event loop, which means that um, there are no blocking operations in Twisted. The, the, the process never has to stop waiting for some action to happen. It always goes back into the loop and you know, switches to, to, to do something else. Um, Twisted is made up of many modules that support different internet protocols. It's got transport modules like TCP and TLS, and then on top of that, you've got HTTP, SSH. Um, many, many, many protocols are supported. Um, it's got a really great API, in my opinion. Um, it's an example of um, strong, well thought out, object oriented design. Um, you know, not all parts of the Python library universe are, are great in this respect, but um, I'm very happy with Twisted. And one of the benefits of, uh, aside from being easy to learn, another benefit of that design is that um, it's very easy to extend and customize Twisted. We have a lot of little hacks that we can insert into Twisted to do certain things, like to support web sockets or to just tweak the behavior of, of HTTP. And we're able to do that without really hacking into the internals because the design is factored so well. OK, so now let's get to the asynchronous part. And to understand what an asynchronous server is, you have to know what a synchronous server is. Um, so a synchronous server is um, where you've got a client talking to a server process. And in this diagram, time goes downward. So at the top, the server gets a request from client A. It does some kind of processing, and it sends a response to client A. But in the meantime, while the server is doing its processing or waiting, it might get a request from another client. And during that time, that other client is not going to get an answer. OK, so we have to fix this by switching from a synchronous model to an asynchronous model, where the server receives a request from one client, it starts some kind of processing, and then goes back to listening for requests from another client so that you can get a lot more parallelism and, in general, bring down the latency between request and response. Um, I should mention we, we, we tend to use a mix of synchronous and asynchronous code paths. And the dividing line, well, basically because asynchronous code is a lot more complicated. So whenever we can do something synchronously, we do it synchronously. And we only break out into asynchronous mode when we're doing something really slow. So a f what we call a fast request would be anything that takes um, on the order of less, less than 100 milliseconds, although you don't want the server to be doing that, that many um, 100 millisecond operations one after another. Um, so these are things like just incrementing a number somewhere, like adding damage or, or, or moving an inventory item around. We, we don't bother making those asynchronous. Um, however, we have some things like when the player logs in or logs out, there's a lot of state that needs to be transmitted to um, offline storage, like Amazon S3. There's also a lot of interaction with third-party APIs, like Facebook, uh, metrics APIs, where we're making HTTP requests out to some third-party server during gameplay, and we don't want the player to have to wait on, on that to come back. Um, and there's also some database uh, queries that are rather slow. OK, so how do you handle this kind of thing in Python? And uh, Twisted is, or it has been a, a, a great answer to that. And first, I'm going to show the simple example of creating a rudimentary synchronous HTTP server with Twisted. And then I'm going to sort of upgrade it to be asynchronous. OK, so this is sort of like the minimal example of what you need to write to create a web server in Twisted. Um, again, the, the code is a little bit paraphrased here, but generally the way it works is you define um, a, a resource, which is kind of like an API endpoint or something that exists at a certain URL. And then that resource has a render method, and the render method takes some parameters in from the client, um, can perform some processing, and then return a response. And so if you just ran this code right here, you'd create a web server that 
you can um, just launch a request at, give it a parameter, say your name, and then it comes back with a response. Okay, but let's pretend we need to do some kind of slow operation in the middle there. So let's say we read, we read in the parameter, but then we've got to do a long database query, and we don't want that database query to block everything else we're doing. Um, and so now we've got a problem, because if we just run the code like this, um, it's going to clog up the entire server waiting for that query. Okay, so we want to make this asynchronous. And the general pattern for doing this is that um, you have what I call the before code, which is like parsing parameters. Then you've got the slow asynchronous operation. And then you've got the after code, where you're sending the result back to the client. Um, so let me just go through this again one more time carefully. The before code is kind of like the pulling the parameters out of the request. The during code is like the long operation. And the after code is responding to the client. Uh, but I haven't mentioned how these pieces are all linked together. And this is the real key to asynchronous programming, is you've got before, during, and after. And the relationship between these is not a simple ABC linear one. Um, there's a lot of complexity to connecting them together. Um, so this is really the central problem in writing low latency servers asynchronously. And there's been a lot of change in the last few years about best practices for how to do this. Um, there's many ways to go about it. Um, years ago, people would have used OS threads to do this sort of thing. I won't even talk about that because that's sort of old fashioned these days. Um, I'm going to talk about two methods. One is explicit callbacks, and the other is um, promises futures. And Twisted kind of bridges those two worlds. So with explicit callbacks, what you do is you take um, code that you want to run later, and you turn it into a function, and then you pass that function as a parameter to your slow asynchronous operation. So you define some kind of handler. You um, run the asynchronous operation, then you pass it, say, OK, after you're done, call this other function. And this style became very popular, um, probably due to JavaScript and, and Node.js, um, where a lot of servers are written in this form. And it sort of makes sense to a programmer who's used to imperative linear um, programming, because you can see what it's doing. It's you know, encapsulating this function, passing it to another function. Um, however, this approach really quickly gets ugly. Um, for instance, what if you have multi-step operations? You might have a database query, and then you get the result, and then you need to do another database query based on that result. Um, and so there's sort of two asynchronous phases. And if you do it with explicit callbacks, you end up having to pass these functions into other functions that get passed into other functions, and it quickly becomes a nightmare. Um, also, you have to worry about error handling through all this. Um, at any stage of the asynchronous operation, things can fail. And you have to have a plan for how you're going to gracefully handle that. You can't just crash the server. You have to sort of return the error at, at the appropriate level. Um, the newer approach to this, and, and I'll give examples of this shortly, is something you'd call promises or futures. And it's a way of um, kind of coming back to the language syntax and using the language runtime to handle the asynchrony. Um, this is turning out to be a really powerful approach because it gives you all the benefits of asynchronous code um, without running into trouble when you need to chain operations or handle errors. And it seems like there's kind of a convergence of network programming in the last few years towards this direction. Um, and, and Python is uh, really at the leading edge of that. Um, so let's go, let's go into how Twisted handles these things. And there's going to be a little bit of history here, because Twisted got into asynchronous programming long before it was considered like a core language runtime feature. And so um, back in the early days, Twisted had this thing called a deferred, um, which is an object that represents the result of an asynchronous operation, which is kind of a strange thing if you've never encountered this before. But um, Here's why it makes sense. You can then attach callbacks and error handlers to run after this operation completes. And the nice thing about encapsulating it in an object is that you no longer have this nested callback problem. Um, you, you can kind of decouple all the different stages of your asynchronous operation um, and then let the library take care of sort of threading the code. And 
I'm showing an example here of how you would use deferred to do that, that asynchronous operation. Um, so you've got up top, you've got the before code, then you create a deferred object to represent the result of the operation, and then add both adds a callback that says, after that operation is done, I want you to jump down here and run this kind of completion handler. And then you call the asynchronous function, and instead of passing it a callback, you pass it the deferred. And then the asynchronous function, um, you know, after it finishes, it fires the deferred by calling callback. And <laughs> if you're like me, when you look at that kind of code flow, you, you get really <laughs> confused. <laughs> because this is, this is the correct, a correct way to write an asynchronous service. And indeed, much of our game server code um, looks like this. Uh, but it's kind of a nightmare. And I, I would hope that, that as a programmer, I don't have to spend my life kind of think, scratching my head going, all right, wh where is the flow of execution here? It goes from the top to the middle, down to the bottom, back up to the top. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. All right, so um, don't, don't write your code this way. And the good news is you, you don't have to. Um, Twisted came up with this cool um, hack called inline callbacks. And what this does, this is a, a very clever use of Python generators, where when you've got an asynchronous operation, um, you can turn it into a generator and then basically wait for the result and pause execution of that sort of thread of execution. I don't mean OS thread, but sort of Python um, call stack. Um, using the idea of a Python generator, which is it saves the call stack and then runs into the generator and then pulls another result out. Um, so this is almost like magic, where you can have the before, during, and after pieces of your asynchronous code right next to each other, and you're letting the language runtime take care of the asynchronous waiting part of it. Um, this makes chaining and error handling really easy because you can do operation one, wait, operation two, and then return result. And um, it does a lot of magic with exception handling so that you can catch exceptions um, along these chains and sort of handle them cleanly. It gets even better than that because um, since um, in Python 3 and in the more rec recent versions, they've included this sort of async await futures concept into the language itself. And Twisted is um, merging its deferred implementation with this so that it can interoperate with other Python libraries that also want to do um, asynchronous operations. So this is the way the future is going to look, where your asynchronous code looks almost exactly like your old synchronous code, and the language runtime takes care of all the magic of suspending execution, chaining things together, um, and doing error handling. So basically, it's vital when you're writing a low latency server to use asynchrony, but it's easy to get into a mess if you try to do that. And by using Twisted and Python and error handlers, uh, you can um, clean things up and, and not have to worry so much about, about your code. All right, I've got just a couple minutes um, before Q&A here, so I just wanna talk about some of the considerations in putting a server like this into production because the sort of tutorial level stuff doesn't cover everything you need. And I just want to briefly touch on two topics. One is tracking of in-flight requests, and the other is latency profiling. Um, asynchronous frameworks are great at letting you suspend execution, do some operation, and then come back later. But they tend not to be very good at making you aware of kind of the state of the whole system. Like, how many asynchronous requests are you, do you currently have waiting? And you can have situations where, for example, you might be trying to store objects in S3 and Amazon is down, you know, so uh, all those requests end up failing and retrying and your server gets clogged up with like hundreds or thousands of, of requests that aren't completing. And the, the basic language and libraries tend not to tell you about this. So you have to kind of write a, um, a bookkeeper or some kind of harness that keeps track of operations. Um, so for each of our asynchronous um, modules, we kind of track like how many, how many requests are on the wire, how many succeeded, how many failed, and so on, um, and also added in some automatic retry logic for that. But this is really important for a production system so that you can, you can um, kind of get metrics on where things are clogging up. Um, and in all this also 
you know, failure cancel paths are really important where, um, uh, you know, you might be taking mutex locks somewhere along the asynchronous chain and you have to be really careful about, you know, releasing the resources uh, appropriately even under an error condition. <laughs> so it's hard to write, don't panic. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, re it's rewarding when you get it right. Uh, finally, I'll talk uh, briefly about latency profiling. Um, so when you get into performance for these sorts of servers, um, the important thing you're watching out for is not how much of the CPU it's using, but what your typical request latency is. And actually, um, the most important thing is what your maximum request latency is. And this is something that a traditional CPU profiler won't help you with. It's only very recently that profiling tools have started to address um, latency as a key metric, as opposed to you know how much uh, CPU is this is this thing using. Um, and so we um, wrap all of our asynchronous operations with timers, um, with like a start time and an end time, so that we can get an idea of the end-to-end -end latency of the system. And here's a, a plot here of some metrics data from our game server showing. Um, each dot is sort of an operation that took um, uh, a certain number of milliseconds to complete. And you can see that most operations are down, you know, we, we, we don't even display the ones that are down below a quarter of a second. But once in a while you get these outliers where the server is not responding to requests for two seconds or three seconds or four seconds. And it's really important to track this um, because these slowdowns will cause a major problem for your users but they're not going to show up on a traditional CPU profile. And you, know, you could end up with very frustrated players. Uh, so basically the way, the way we handle this is every time there's an entry point to the server, meaning any, anything that can like begin an operation and we want to track how long it's going to take from the start of that operation to when the client hears back, we kind of... Um, wrap that with a timer that gets the start time and the end time, and then we have a, like a metric system that, that just keeps track of like average and peak latency. Um, and this is pretty fine-grained. It's like every type of message that the game server can get uh, is tracked in this way. And you can do fancy things with Python decorators to, um, to make this better. So yeah, collect average latency, maximum latency. Um, if you really want to get advanced, you track kind of percentile latencies. There's a lot of tools coming out that, uh, that help you do this. Um, things like New Relic and, and uh, you know, latency measurement is starting to become pretty mainstream now. Uh, but it wasn't back when we were <laughs> initially starting. Here's an example of uh, a latency sort of scoreboard where we're looking at requests coming in and there's like an average latency for each request. There's a maximum latency. And you see that we have like... Um, the average latency is very low, it's like half a millisecond, but once in a while we have these very long requests that take um, you know, more than a second. And as long as they're infrequent, it's not too much of a problem, but you can notice hot spots here. Um, and basically, uh, one thing we also track is you, we kind of add up all the time that the CPU is processing requests, and we call that unhalted load. So like, what percentage of the time is that process executing as opposed to waiting, uh, waiting for new requests to come in? And that metric is really important to watch because if it gets close to 50%, you're near a kind of live lock state where um, requests are coming in faster than the server can handle them. And that will do very bad things to your, to your service. So keep it way below 50%. Anyway, so have fun with Twisted. Uh, sorry this was kind of a whirlwind tour of asynchronous network programming, but I, I hope I've provided a bit of background on, on uh, how to get into this. And I think we're ready to open it up to questions. Thanks, Dan. Um, we are a little bit short on time, so just one question. Maybe the one here in front. Thank you. Uh, how do you use multi-core systems, or you are just single-threaded and uh, uh, multi-instances? Multi. It's one Python process per core, so and there's no. Core they're core. shared. I don't know what you'd call it. Sort of. Sh they're not sharing memory. They're just. Um, there's a load balancer that's distributing the socket connections amongst many different processes, and th those can also be split across machines in addition to splitting across cores. Thank you. <laughs>